Hello, my name is Jamie Shuttler and I'm a research scientist at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory in the UK. And this is a short video about the European Space Agency project Ocean Flux Greenhouse Gases. Now the oceans cover over two thirds of the surface of the Earth and we know that they influence our atmosphere and our climate. So for instance, over half of the oxygen that we actually breathe comes from the oceans. So clearly it's important for us to be able to understand how gases like oxygen can move between the ocean and the atmosphere. Now one gas we're particularly interested in is carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide is emitted when we burn fossil fuels, such as when we drive our cars. However, once in the atmosphere, it acts as an insulating layer or a blanket around the Earth. So the more carbon dioxide we actually emit, the thicker the insulation becomes and the warmer the Earth becomes. And this process is often referred to as global warming. Now we know that the oceans actually absorb a third or 30% of the carbon dioxide that we emit each year. Once in the water though, the carbon dioxide can actually change the acidity of the water and this can impact on the marine life that are actually in the oceans. So for instance, it may become more difficult for sea urchins to grow their shells in a more acidic ocean. So, how on earth does this carbon dioxide actually get into the ocean in the first place? Well, you can see an example of this over my shoulder here with these breaking waves. So as the wave breaks, you get this white capping that's appearing. So this is where the water is actually capturing a pocket of air and this goes into the, into the sea as a bubble, and as the bubble disperses, the gases within it also disperse into the ocean. So, for instance, carbon dioxide would be captured in one of these bubbles. So we've just talked about how waves can actually influence the amount of carbon dioxide that goes into the oceans. The temperature is actually also very important. So the amount of carbon dioxide that actually stays in the water can vary throughout the globe based on temperature. So for instance in cold arctic waters these can actually hold more carbon dioxide than say warm equatorial waters that you find around places like the Caribbean. So for example I can illustrate this with these two bottles of fizzy drink. This one here represents our warm equatorial uh, waters such as the Caribbean and this one is cold and this represents our arctic waters. So when I drop this aspirin into the warm bottle, the carbon dioxide is, leaves the, the liquid very, very quickly and we get a lot, a lot of bubbles appear. Whereas when I drop the tablets into the cold bottle, we get a lot less gas actually escaping from the liquid and a lot fewer bubbles. So now we've seen how waves and temperature can both affect the amount of carbon dioxide that actually stays in our oceans. And obviously here at the beach we could take a water sample and measure how much carbon dioxide is actually in the water. However, if we're interested in looking at the whole of the globe and all of the oceans, we really need to go into space and use satellites which look back down upon the Earth. And this is exactly what we're doing in the Ocean Flux Greenhouse Gases Project. Within the project, we're using many different types of data from different types of satellites. For example, this is Envisat, which is a European Space Agency satellite. And when it was uh, orbiting the Earth, it was 500 miles up. It's about the size of two double-decker buses, and it was travelling at a speed of about 16,000 miles per hour. So every day, this satellite was orbiting the Earth 14 times. And this particular satellite uh, carries a number of different sensors, one of which is able to measure near-infrared spectrum data, and this enables us to estimate the temperature of the water. Another sensor it carries is a radar instrument, and this enables us to look at waves and wind speed. So, for example, this is the average wind uh, wave height over the whole of the year for the whole of the globe. So you can see in the Southern Ocean here, we're getting wave heights around sort of four or five metres, and then in the in the Northern Atlantic, we're getting average wave heights of about four metres as well. So if we combine this, as we explained on the beach, we combine the wind data. Uh, we can estimate the white capping. We then use the temperature data, we can estimate how much of the carbon dioxide is actually staying in the ocean. And that means we can then estimate the amount of flux, or the amount of movement of the carbon dioxide between the ocean and the atmosphere. So for example, this is a result. So you can see this red area here, this is equatorial region, so if you remember this means that we have warmer water, which means that the water is able to carry less carbon dioxide. And in this particular case, the carbon dioxide is actually leaving the ocean and going into the atmosphere. You can see in the northern North Atlantic here, these areas of blue are actually where you have colder water, and this is where carbon dioxide is going into the ocean. So if we then study these processes using a range of different satellites over multiple years, 
we get a much greater understanding on how this carbon dioxide is actually moving between the ocean and the atmosphere. And equally, it enables us to then start looking at how much of the carbon dioxide is staying within the ocean itself. Now, part of the work within ocean flux itself is to try and reduce some of the errors in these methods uh, and fully understand how those errors are impacting on our estimates of the fluxes. And in the future, this work will ultimately enable us to improve our predictions of future climate scenarios.